Good morning. It's Monday morning. Yesterday was a busy day. We went and went and went. And then we came home and went to bed. <laughs> Praise God. It was a good day. I hope that things are well with you. We had good services yesterday all day long. At Galena yesterday morning, and then an ordination service at Shiloh yesterday afternoon. And tonight, I was at the Full Gospel Church, and we had a big, big time. I got to play with the band and uh, sing with Josh and Gayla. It was great. And then I got to be on a panel discussion with Brother Akins, and we did Q&A afterward. And uh, I always like doing that. That's my favorite thing to do. I, I like preaching the cross and teaching the Bible. It's about all I think about anymore. We wrapped up Saturday. We wrapped up chapter 22 of Jeremiah. And that is, uh, that is the completion of uh, God's judgment on the kings of Judah. Specifically those since Josiah. There was uh, uh, Je Je Jehoiahaz. There was... Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, there was uh, Jehoiakim, there was Jehoiachin, uh, there was Zedekiah. And uh, just backing up, uh, since we're going to be in a completely different period <clears throat> right here, <clears throat> This is not part of that sermon. This is another sermon. And the beginning of verse 23. But I will just, I'll just go ahead and back up and wrap because I'm used to doing it. We'll do the recap. It'll be brief about the judgment of the last king, the surviving king. It wasn't the last king in order, but he was Nebuchadnezzar who took him to Babylon and kept him. And uh, actually kept him alive. And then Nebuchadnezzar's son, Evil Merodak, he lifted up uh, Jeconiah's head in uh, in prison, and so in verse twenty four he says, "As I live, saith the Lord, though Coniah the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, were the signet upon my right hand, yet I would pluck thee hence, and I will give thee into the hand of them that seek thy life." He's talking to Zedekiah. Zedekiah is his uncle. And into the hand of them whose face thou fearest, even into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and into the hand of the Chaldeans. And I will cast thee out, and thy mother that bare thee into another country, where ye were not born, and there ye shall die. But to the land whereunto they desire to return, thither shall they not return. Is this man can I a despised broken idol? Is he a vessel wherein is no pleasure? Wherefore are they cast out? He and his seed and are cast into a land which they know not. Well, we find out 37 years later that he was in jail and evil Merodak lifted up his face and led him out of jail and let him live like a king for the rest of his life. And he had sons and daughters and one of those sons became the ancestor of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, which is called Christ. O earth, O earth, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. This is, this is cool. If people won't listen, the world will listen. Jesus said, the, the Pharisees said, they were saying, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. The people were saying, the Pharisees said that, Hey, you hear what the people are saying? Shut them up. And Jesus said, let them alone. He said, look, <laughs> if they were silent, the rocks would cry out because I'm coming into Jerusalem. And God won't talk. If people won't hear him. God's talking to the ground because one day God is going to redeem the earth just the same as he will redeem man in the resurrection, in the glorified body, in the millennium, in the kingdom. That is the believing man. Thus saith the Lord, write ye this man childless, not 
Coniah, not Jeconiah, but Zedekiah, this last king, a man that shall not prosper in his days, for no man of his seed shall prosper, sitting upon the throne of David and ruling any more in Jerusalem. And we saw how Zedekiah tried to run. The armies of the king of Babylon got him. They stood all his sons in front of him, and they killed his sons before his eyes, and then they put his eyes out. Then they carried him to Babylon in chains, and there he died. So he was childless, just as this prophecy was given. Now we move along to, we're going to move back a little bit to 599, 600, something like that. This is a different prophecy beginning in chapter 23. It actually, in the long term, it speaks about the restoration of Israel when Israel would be restored as a nation and actually as a kingdom. It's not talking about the the remnant, the few thousand that came back with Ezra and Nehemiah and uh, Zerubbabel and, and uh, Joshua, or Joshua the, uh, the high priest, any of those guys. No, no, uh, that wasn't the return he was talking about, the restoration he was talking about. <clears throat> the restoration of the incarnation, there was no restoration in the incarnation. Jesus suffered and bled and died on an old rugged cross, and by his blood we are saved. By his cross we are saved. By his resurrection we have eternal life. It's not, uh, it's not the way of the creek that leads home, friends. It's the way of the cross, Jesus Christ and him crucified. It's not talking about the restoration of Jerusalem and the restoration of, of Judah into modern Israel uh, that began uh, officially on May the 14th, 1948, and continues yet to this day. It's not what he's talking about, although... What he's, you know, what we're going to see in Israel now is a fulfillment of Bible prophecy, because uh, it was a nation formed in a day, and uh, <clears throat> it was prophesied that that uh, that in the end times, in the days right before Jacob's trouble. Good morning, Doug. That Jerusalem would become a cup of trembling. Uh, they would, they would, they would. Uh, just perplex the entirety of all the nation of the world that everything would be centered in Jerusalem and it is pointing that way right now but he's not talking about that restoration he's talking about the restoration of Israel in the millennial kingdom when he the Lord Jesus Christ will sit on the throne of David hey Doug yeah good morning will sit on the throne of David and he will rule with a rod of iron and the law will go forth from Mount Zion that day's coming. That's the restoration this talks about. But for now, he is leveling a charge against Zedekiah, the king, and against all his princes and the chief priests and the rulers of the temple and all the landowners and the merchants, all the rich people. You see, in any society, it's the same now as it was in any society. you got a bunch of higher-ups that decide everything for everybody else and spend all the money. You know, we dress it up in diplomatic trapping, trappings here, uh, you know, and, 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 and uh, but you can't tell me that Donald Trump and Joe Biden are the two best people in the whole United States that could be our president. So you see, we only have a choice of whom we're offered, <laughs> you know, so there you go. Uh it's the same as it was then. You have rich people and higher ups, the ruling class, and they decide what everybody does. It was no different then, and and so in in ancient Judah, right before the uh, the fall, this would be maybe a year, either a year before the siege or right about the time of the siege the final siege of Jerusalem where Babylon's armies finally encircled the town and there's no way out. It's during that time that uh, this prophecy comes and, and, and Jeremiah is, God is using Jeremiah to put a, a prophecy and a condemnation upon Zedekiah and all of the ruling class because of the way they treat the people. Now, you got to give... <laughs> 
In practicality, what else could they do? Jehoiakim, Zedekiah's older brother, Jehoiakim, he was a puppet king of Pharaoh, and he had to steal from the people and tax the people to pay off Pharaoh so Pharaoh wouldn't come kill him. And then Nebuchadnezzar defeated Egypt's imperial armies and pushed Egypt all the way back to their homeland below the Saudi desert, the Arabian desert. And so with that empire pushed back, then Nebuchadnezzar flexed his muscle and he made Jehoiakim a puppet king. Jehoiakim rebelled. He came and died, and, and Nebuchadnezzar came and put his son, Jeconiah, Jehoiachin, Coniah, put him on the throne as a puppet king. And he didn't last very long. Nebuchadnezzar didn't like the way he was ruling, so he didn't kill him. He, he, he took him down. Jehoiachin surrendered, and they took him to Babylon. I told you that he lived there for 37 years, and then he got let out of jail. And now Zedekiah is a puppy king, and he's been a puppy king for some time now, about eight years. And he finally rebels. He's not going to pay Nebuchadnezzar any more gold, possibly because there's not that much gold left. I mean, you can only use other people's money for so long before you run out of it. <laughs> and, you know, all the king could have was what people gave him or what he taxed him or what he took with the sword and the bow. So that's how that's how kings fought back then. They fought for booty. You know, you went to war with somebody so you could take their gold and their wine and their women. That That's why you fought back then. Matter of fact, the United States is the only nation on the face of the earth, the only army on the face of the earth that did not fight for conquest, that did not fight for booty, that did not fight for loot. Um, but that's the way it was all the way up until us. So Jeremiah is talking to Zedekiah, this puppet king who has beaten his people to pieces, trying to pay Nebuchadnezzar the toll, the vigorous, the bribe, the tribute money. Well, now he's rebelled. He's not paying the tribute money, mainly because he doesn't have any more to pay. And this is when Jeremiah gives him this prophecy. He says, Woe unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. There were people running away uh, to the old Israel, which was now run by Babylonian, which had been run by the Assyrians since they captured it 100 years before. But now Syria had been subsumed into the Babylonian Empire. But there were people that were leaving the country. They were going to Egypt. They were going to Libya. They were going to Ethiopia. They were going to Lebanon. They were going to Philistia. They were going to, <laughs> they were going to Ammon. They were going to Edom. They were, they were like trying to get out because things were getting so bad in Judah. So he has destroyed some of the sheep and he scattered some. Woe and be unto the pastures that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. Therefore saith the Lord God of Israel against the pastures that feed my flock. Now remember, these pastors are not pastors of churches like preachers. He's talking about the rulers, the people who the people who run things, the people who are in charge, the people who oversee. Therefore, the government, and that's spelled G-U-V-M-I-N-T, the government. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of Israel against the pastors that feed my flock, you have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doings. You see, the ones who 
had not left the country. They had got out of Jerusalem because they saw that soon and very soon the city was, the city was going to be encircled. So they escaped to the countryside. They found a farm that somebody else had abandoned, and they settled down there, and they started trying to grow some food for the for the season, you know, to get them through the winter. They started trying to make some kind of life outside the besieged city where at least they could eat bread or dig roots or anything they could do to eat and survive because anyone knew back then when an army besieges a city and cuts it off and encircles it, it's only a matter of time before that city surrenders because they can't get any more food in the gates. They can't get any more. And he had scattered the people, that uh, his own people, and driven them away because of his bad decisions, because of his taxations. There were probably some rich people hiding in the countryside because they had, you know, three gold shekels left, <laughs> and they didn't want they didn't want uh, Zedekiah to take those last three shekels and give them to the king of Babylon. Uh, you know, you talk, talk about taxes now. You know, you can fight your taxes in court for ten, fifteen years. And sometimes you even win if they get it wrong. But back then, the king came to your door with soldiers, and you had to pay up. If you owed a talent of gold, you had to pay a talent of gold, or they'd put you in jail or kill you. Why else would they bring soldiers? That's why, you know, never fight with the IRS or the government, because sooner or later they will send U.S. Marshals to get you, and you will have to leave. Either that or treasury agents. You know, it's best to obey the law. And then if you can't obey the law, try to change the law. Unless it's something that you know you're breaking the law of God. The day that they come and tell me to pre quit preaching the cross, that's the day they'll have to carry me to jail. Because I will not stop. And to get me to shut up, they'll have to kill me. And if I live long enough, they will. I look forward to it because I know that great is my reward in heaven. And I know that whatever they do to me, they cannot change my mind. The same holds true for you. You don't have to participate in their shenanigans. You do not have to go along with a godless, graceless world. You don't have to do it. You do not have to participate. You can withdraw. <clears throat> but I would advise you to extend your longevity on earth to fight for the Lord, to do whatever they say unless it conflicts with God's law, and to pay what you owe, or they'll throw you in jail. That's just a reality, friends. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of Israel against the pastors that feed my flock. You have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doings, saith the Lord. He's still talking to the ruling class uh, personified by King Zedekiah. Verse 3, And I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries whither I have driven them and will bring them again to their folds and they shall be fruitful and increase no matter how bad you treat them and a lot of this is your fault Zedekiah and the fault of your brothers but not the fault of your father but the fault of his father and many fathers before and all the, the, all the kings who ignored my laws and all the people who would not come to me all the people who went a-whoring after other gods, all the people who sacrificed their children, and all the people who believed the lies of the lying prophets. I'll bring back a remnant. They'll come back into this country, and they'll be fruitful. Now, that happened 70-plus years later when Ezra, Nehemiah, Zerubbabel, when they brought Zechariah, Haggai, when they brought the people out of Egypt, out of, out of Egypt, out of Babylon, and brought them back to Judah. 
to a Jerusalem that would burn down, the gates were burned down, the walls were falling down, the temple had been destroyed, but they brought them there and they started rebuilding again. That was a remnant. But that remnant doesn't fulfill the next verse. You see, this is something, we're going to see that this return of the remnant is something that has not happened yet. Neither is it fulfilled by the return and reestablishment of Israel in 1948. This is a this is a return of a remnant that is yet to come, because this hasn't happened yet. And I will set up shepherds over them, which shall feed them, and they shall fear no more. Well, they got pretty good shepherds in Israel right now, but they're afraid every day. Because the bombs are coming in every day. The missiles are coming in every day. The terrorists are coming in every day. The enemy is within the gates. So there is fear. And they shall fear no more nor be dismayed. They're dismayed. You know, the people are rising up against the only government capable of defending them right now. And that is the unity government between Netanyahu and uh, the other hawks. Uh, who some of them are way far to the left, but they believe in the preservation of Israel, and so they they flock together. But soon, the uh, cries of the liberals and the peacemakers, you see, you can't make peace with these Arabs that are living in Jerusalem and living in Judah. But you can't do it. You just can't do it because they want to kill you. You hear it on the news every night when these... Uh, pro-Palestinian protesters are saying from the river to the sea that means they're going to kill every Jew from the river to the sea from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea they can't rule in what they call Palestine from the river to the sea unless they destroy Jerusalem unless they kill every Jew so, <clears throat> there is plenty of fear. There is plenty of dismay. It says, neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. Right now, Netanyahu's government is begging our government to resupply the Iron Dome. When the Iron Dome goes down, it's going to turn into a land and trench war. It's going to be terrible. It's going to start looking like Ukraine, which already looks like World War II, and in some places looks like World War I. God said that I will bless them that bless you, and I will curse them that curse you, speaking of Israel. <clears throat> we can't withhold arms from Israel. And let these criminals take over. Can't do it. A lot of people hate me for this. It's not that I'm pro-Israel as much as I'm pro-God. I'm not going to go against the word of the Lord. Now, if you don't believe in God, then you can believe whatever you want to believe. It's a free country. But the God who lives forever said to pray for the peace of Jerusalem that Jerusalem is the apple of his eye, that his eyes are always upon Jerusalem, that he that keepeth Israel doth neither slumber nor sleep. He's always watching, <clears throat> and he's always keeping. And I don't know about you, but I'm not going to fight against God. And I'm not going to support anybody that fights against God. These people, they want to live in peace and lay down their arms. If Hamas lays down their arms, there'll be peace immediately in Israel. If Israel lays down their arms, there'll be no more Israel. You can't negotiate with people who are determined to kill you. It just doesn't make sense. Quit trying to make sense of it. Quit trying to do it. So... 
we have not read this time in verse four has not been fulfilled. And I will set up shepherds over them, which shall feed them and they shall fear no more nor be dismayed. Neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. Now this day certainly hasn't come. In verse five, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch. Who's this righteous, righteous branch? He's the root of Jesse. He is the branch of David. He's the consolation of Israel. He's the fear of Isaac. He's the God of Abraham. He's our kinsman redeemer. He is Jehovah Sid Canu. The Lord is our righteousness. And when I read that Hebrew word, I thought it was, you know, I thought it was a comedy routine about I, like I can roll boat canoe, you know, Sid Canu. He sounds like a Jewish comedian. Ha! Like Sophie Sales or Sid Melton. You know, that's pretty cool. Uh, okay, we just came out of a glitch. Let me finish this verse and we'll pick this up tomorrow. And it says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch. And a king, king of kings, and the Lord of lords, shall reign and prosper and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. There will be no judgment or justice in the earth until King Jesus sits on the throne of his father, David, in Jerusalem. And the law goes out from Mount Zion. In his days, verse 6, Judah shall be saved. Judah's not saved yet. Judah doesn't even exist yet except in the eye of God. Judah shall be saved and Israel shall dwell safely. They don't dwell safely now. So this is coming in the future. And this is his name whereby he should be called. This branch, this king that sits on the throne of his father, David. What is his name? His name is Jehovah Sid Canu, which means the Lord, our righteousness. And that is a completely saved and redeemed kingdom of Israel. That is Christ's kingdom on earth. That is the kingdom we pray for every time we say the Lord's prayer. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, done in earth as it is in heaven. That is the kingdom we're praying to come. The kingdom, the millennial kingdom, and the everlasting rule of our Lord Jesus Christ. First in the millennial kingdom, then in the new heavens and the new earth. You know, and the Lord is our righteousness can only apply to saved people because unsaved people try to have their own righteousness. And our own righteousness is like a filthy rag, according to Isaiah. But they, Judah, Israel, they will come to a time when they will say the Lord is our righteousness. And that's what every saved person now has to say. The Lord is my righteousness. Jesus is my righteousness. I have none of my own. For he was made to be sin for us, which knew no sin, that we might be able, that we might become, <clears throat> that we might, that, that he, let, 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 let. for he made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So anyway, we'll pick this up again tomorrow. The Lord is our righteousness. So I don't want to get cut off again.